Uh, you are pretending to be a, a university, but uh, the fact that your entry requirements are less stringent than those of the University of Malta, does mm -hmm. this uh, undermine the standard and quality of uh, the education at St. Martin? I mean, my, my immediate reaction is surely not. But the mentality is different. Even from when we started in 2000, it has changed. I, I'd like to take you back, if you can, actually move back to the year 2000, when we started. At the time, it was St. Martin's and the University of Malta. And there was a gap there. But in 2003, MPRAS was set up. And remember that today, a student who um, starts at MPRAS at maybe a foundation diploma or a first diploma can also continue step by step to get a degree. So in Malta itself, in the state institutions mm -hmm. themselves, there is now the split in mentality. And that you do not gauge the standard of education simply by checking out the entry requirements. What the University of London is all about, and what we therefore are all about, is the exit standard. Mm -hmm. If a student may not have the full admissions criteria for the University of Malta, not for the University of London, because we have our own admissions criteria, two A levels, for all levels, and in the case of ICT, you need to have at least a mathematics subject in those. If you have those minimum requirements, and you can manage to sit for the same examination papers, as Dr. Browning was saying, and you manage to get good grades in those papers, the University of London, its mentality is, of course, I will confer you with a degree. Mm -hmm. If you don't manage to get good grades in those exams, you will end up with no degree. So it's not something that simply because of the entrance requirements, they may be a little bit lower than what is normal with the University of Malta, but higher than what is at MCAS. Very important this, right? Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't mean that the value of the teaching and value of education that the student is obtaining from the University of London, because we follow the syllabus as presented to us by the University of mm -hmm. London, is anything lower. Um, to that is provided locally. Let me be straightforward. Mm -hmm. Do you consider your institute as an educational or a commercial institution? We are an educational institution. Um, we call ourselves social entrepreneurs. We provide an educational service with a mentality that we need to at least sustain ourselves, preferably make a profit to be able to reinvest that profit into our institution. And that is what we have done during these 25 years. We've never had any sponsor for St. Martin's. We have churned back all the excess income that we may have had over the years into reinvesting into our own facilities themselves. I can say that the worst nightmare is to have brick and mortar. And if you're a building here, everybody know yes. the price of real estate here in Malta. But slowly, St. Martin's has grown and developed itself to have two buildings. And, and therefore, we can provide our students with the mm -hmm. services that they expect out of a teaching institution of our Including of our a science. library and so on? Including a library, including computer labs, including a canteen and common room, including the facilities that a student in Malta expects. Now, here I do make a distinction. We remember that Malta being a very small island, and the tendency is that students still live with their families if mm -hmm. they are full-time. And if they are evening students, I mean, they live very close to the school. Everywhere is close to the school. So we are not like maybe international universities where you need to have um, uh, student houses and you would have accommodation within campus, you know, where actually students and lecturers and academic staff live in the vicinity of but the university. But you cater for foreign students as well. I yes, understand. we do. Yes, we do. And we have obviously an accommodation services for them. Most of our international students prefer to live in the Sliema St. Julian's area because it is also the main entertainment area of Malta. But some of the students actually live in the vicinity of the college. I mean, these students come from China, come from India, come from countries where you have to travel an hour and a half to get anywhere. Here in Malta, in 10 minutes, 15 minutes, you're actually at school. The final question to you, uh, Mr. Toma. Dr. Brownick has highlighted the excellent results that the Institute has achieved over the past 10 years. Is there anything special going on? I hope so, and I think so. And basically, this something special that is going on is that I think in these past 10 years, I've personally experienced the joy of 
individuals who thought they were good for nothing, mm -hmm. thought that they could never actually even imagine of reading for a degree, and actually get a first class or a second upper in their degree. Is due to hard working students? It is due to maturity. Many of the students would have spent time at a place of work. I'm talking especially for the evening students. They would have spent time at a place of work. Maybe the trivialities of when they were 16 to 17 would have rubbed off and they would understand the rigor of life, what it all means. And they do a double sacrifice because these people keep a full-time job. And apart from a full-time job, they then come in the evening to study at St. Martin's and to really work very hard into attaining those types of classifications. I think we have managed to, in a way, be magicians in this respect. Mm -hmm. We have managed to provide self-belief into individuals. Mm -hmm. We've had individuals who were dropouts of the educational system. And today, one in particular, but I think not just one, um, who is doing a PhD in Holland in the subject. So, so yes, there is something special. Surely it is the hard work of my teaching staff. But surely I can never belittle the amount of work mm -hmm. that the students themselves put into their, their own program, their own education. Some in Malta tell me, you have an advantage. They tell me, your students are paying for their service. It might be um, uh, part of the formula as well. Once you are paying for something, you start realizing the value of that something. So you're not going to just spend time at St. Mm -hmm. Martin's, mm -hmm. spend money and not getting something out of it. It may be. Um, uh, but I think it's really a combination of everything all together, and we have performed so amiably well. Let's be more specific. Dr. Brown and Kirk will come back to you now. I personally remember the launching of a degree in creative computing some years back. What exactly was behind the idea of this degree? A long history of changes in what is relevant to study in computing. Areas like computer games, effective web development, the uses of computers in advertising, film graphics, aiding with sound manipulation for films, endless areas uh, which Mr. Lewis can speak rather better than I, are becoming increasingly important and are multi-billion pound industries with a very long-term future. An ordinary media-based degree can very often leave a graduate just knowledgeable about handling packages like Photoshop, maybe a video editing suite, but trapped within a framework of only being able to do things in ways that all people already do. Goldsmiths, in many ways, is Britain's leading creative university, and it's far more interested in doing things from the basics. So the idea of letting somebody realize their own creative vision in their own way means they need to understand a great many technical details mm -hmm. in terms of mathematics, programming, databases, all the regular parts of a full computing degree, plus have the benefits of understanding aspects of creativity and media mixed with that. So it's a solid mm -hmm. tech, and the tagline for the degree could be it's for those who want to move towards being technically competent creative professionals and so it's providing a wide range of wide range of facilities and abilities in graduates. Dr Lewis I would like to have your perspective about this as well. I can only really agree with what my colleague David has said. Um, I think if you go back a generation and, and look at the output from typical computer science courses it was very traditional dry computer science the kind of skills that were ideal for building databases, management information systems, and, and, and stuff of that nature. What we're seeing now in the post-dot-com world is a wonderful collision between creativity and technology. If you look at um, very successful websites like Facebook, like MySpace, like YouTube, those are sites that are built on solid technical underpinnings with a great deal of creativity. and. To be able to create those, those kind of enterprises, society has to produce graduates that are capable of understanding both the technical issues and the creative opportunities. But this is not only for gaming, I understand, isn't it? Oh, it it's certainly not only for gaming. I mean, gaming is a, a very nice kind of headline, blue ribbon activity because gaming is something that the kids understand. 
it, it's very easy as a lecturer to be able to teach a lot of serious and deep computer science using gaming as, as a meta, maybe not a metaphor, but as a vehicle for that. If you want to talk to students about high performance computing in constrained environments, if you want to talk to students about real-time graphics um, delivery or working with um, significant numbers of users concurrently, video games and the video games industry provides wonderful opportunities mm -hmm. to illustrate that. If you look at the success of, say, something like World of Warcraft, World of Warcraft is built on top of a massive relational database system and a very efficient networking system that can deal with 14 million subscribers a month. What type of 